You know, if the Stanley Cup final were to go to seven games, game seven would be Monday, June the 24th. Then just four days later, it would be the NHL draft at the Sphere. And then two days after that, it would be free agent frenzy, which would mean our friend Pierre Lebrun, our TSN hockey insider, would be very, very busy, as he is already. In fact, Pierre joins us just back from the scouting combine in Buffalo, New York. Pierre, how is Buffalo? Buffalo was a productive work trip. Jay, that's how I would determine that <laughs> adventure in Buffalo for 48 hours. Uh, no, it was cool. You know, as I said last week when I was on the show, it's, I mean, you can see it with your own eyes because most of the people hang out in the same hotel. All these GMs meeting with each other, GMs meeting with agents, and obviously the, the draft prospects. But so much of it, though, is laying the groundwork for trades and signings here over the next four or five weeks. And I was it's reading time of year. And, and I was reading your your recent rumblings in the athletic and you know you talked a little bit about Kenny Holland. His name had been mentioned at one point tied to the Columbus Blue Jackets but his deal with the Oilers Pierre expires June the 30th. This is wild. And I know you spoke to the president of the team Jeff Jackson about a potential succession plan. What did Jeff Jackson have to say. Uh, essentially he said no comment none of my business uh, <laughs> no he was he was very polite about it uh, I mean listen they obviously have a plan they're not sharing that with anyone they've done a really good job of not making this a distraction and I know that for Ken Holland and you'll probably hear this from him on media day Friday in Florida because he's doing a, a press conference like the GMs always do before the final he does not want his future to be a even a minute of time for anyone in terms of taking away from what the Oilers have in front of them here. Uh, and I think he feels he owes that to Connor McDavid and, and to Leon Dreisaitl that that his future as GM is not a story. It's going to be hard for him to control that because, as you said, I mean, his deal expires at the end of the month. I mean, but I'm sure he hoped that he hopes that it expires a few days after a big parade. So we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, my sense is, is that, Ken Holland probably, uh, you know, won't be back as GM. I, I think that's that's probably obvious. I mean, they would have extended him by now if if you were right, Jay. Yep. But uh, but I also think that Ken Holland's absolutely fine with whatever is around the corner for him. And then you've got Bill Zito, the GM in Florida. He's got a whole other bunch of stuff to worry about because, as we said, the timeline's so tight, and he has two major free <laughs> agents, unrestricted free agents, in Sam Reinhart and Brandon Montour. Pierre, this is like a lot for Zito to deal with. Can he get one or both of them signed, do you think? Yeah, I, I think I have a feeling that he'll get Reinhardt signed and maybe not Montour. I think it's too much to get both signed. Uh, and uh, we'll see, though. He's pulled a lot of rabbits out of the hat over the last few years in putting this, uh, this juggernaut roster together. But you're right. It, it, what's wild about it is that, you know, when you speak to both sides in the Sam Reinhardt, uh, you know, discussion there really haven't been meaningful meaningful contract talks the entire season they kind of mm. shelved it and said let's focus on trying to go win a cup and then we'll we'll revisit this and you know one of the things Sam Reinhardt told me in early April when the Panthers were were coming through Toronto is that he himself has such a good relationship with GM Bill Zito that he feels he's in a comfortable place when it's time to get going on this so that was interesting. You don't hear that from a player every time. It, it speaks, I think, to, you know, the symbiotic chemistry that's in that Panthers organization from top to bottom. And he obviously doesn't want to leave, but he's going to leave money on the table if he stays with the Florida Panthers. Mm -hmm. He will not get what the market would be willing to pay a 50-goal scorer. Um, and, you know, tax-free in Florida, you have to account for that. But at the end of the day, Matthew Kachuk makes nine and a half and, and Alexander Barkov makes 10 million. That's your natural inner cap in Florida, right? So I suspect that the number that comes at Reinhardt just before July 1st on the Panthers probably starts with an eight. That's uh, going to be we'll truly fascinating to see how it plays out, just as it'll be fascinating to see what happens with Mitch Barner this year. Uh, I know his agent, Darren Ferris, has said that Marner <laughs> wants to play the year out wants to honor the final year of his contract. I know Leafs Nation would love Brad Tree Living to make some sort of deal here. What's your what's your take on it, Pierre? What do you expect to happen with Marner both this offseason and going into the next season going forward? Yeah. 
Are, be, are people talking about this? <laughs> I just want to make sure. Um, you know, uh, you know, Darren Ferris and Brad Chuliving met yesterday at the Combine in Buffalo. Uh, you know, that's important to point out. Um, you know, I, I sat down with Brad Living at the end of the day uh, Tuesday, and we talked about this. He gave me a very lengthy, thoughtful answer about this whole thing. One is that, he does not want to do play-by-play -play in the media on where this goes from here on in. It felt like I might be, I might have gotten one of the last quotes for a while from the Leafs GM on this subject. Um, and number two, it was clear if I were to summarize, and, and you could go read the quote in my piece in the Athletic, but if I could summarize the the sense that I got from Tree Living, is that all options are on the table basically. Mm -hmm. They know Mitch Marner is a great player, and he could remain a Leaf, but. Um, you know, Brad Chilling has a job to do, and it's his job to try and make this team better. And, and within that, without him saying this explicitly to me, it's clear that he owes it as because of his job as Jim Lee to talk to the team about Mitch Marner. I mean, that's just reality. And so does he come back to the Marner camp with a trade fit? And how does the Marner camp react to that? That's what will play out here over, over the next several weeks. But honestly, right now, again, what I got from Brad Tree Living was that he's trying to make this roster better and all options are on the table. So, uh, and that includes either keeping Marner or trading him. And then, as you know, Pierre, for Tree Living, that's not his only order of business. He's got a couple of pending unrestricted free agents in Tyler Bertuzzi and Max Domi that he would like to sign. The question is, do you think he'll be able to sign one or even both of them? I don't think he can get both signed. I think he might be able to get one signed. Both of those players um, are looking for multi-year deals, as they should. I mean, they both took one-year deals last year. It was kind of a weird summer last year where a lot of agents were reading the reading the the market and saying this is the you know last year was the last sort of pandemic flat cap environment. Yeah. Yep. And finally, now this summer, the cap's going up $4 million. And so a lot of good players were taking one-year deals around the league, not just those two guys. But that's not happening again, <laughs> at least if <laughs> the agents for both those players have their way. And so what Brad Chilling said is, yeah, he likes those two players. And, and the door's open to, to, to talk to both those camps and try and find a fit. But it has to work for the lease, has to work for them. You know, read between the lines, I think that... There's a limit to how far the Leafs would, would be willing to go in both those scenarios. So, again, we'll, we'll see where that goes. And, and, and there's no question that, that those would be agents that Brad Living would be trying to see here uh, this week in Buffalo. And the former coach of the Leafs, Sheldon Keefe, uh, is now with the New Jersey Devils. He's got a four-year contract. What he doesn't have is that elite starting goaltender that Tom Fitzgerald, the GM of the team, craves. We know Fitzgerald went after Jake Markstrom of the Flames last season. Perhaps he circles back with Craig Conroy on that. But we also know Linus Allmark has a year left on his deal, Pierre. And we know that there's a potential for him to be on the move. Do you think, Pierre, that Fitzgerald gets a deal done for a legitimate number one starting goaltender this offseason? Yes, I think he'll get it done, finally. Um, and listen, they got a good 1B in veteran Jake Allen, but now they're trying to get the 1A. And uh, those conversations with the Flames have taken up again. We know that those two teams almost had a deal done before the trade deadline uh, earlier this season, before March 8th. It fell apart, but the Devils remain interested in Jacob Markstrom. And more importantly, I guess, or as, you know, as importantly, you know, Jacob Markstrom has a full no move, but he's, my understanding is he's willing to go to New Jersey. I, I will also say this, that there are other teams now that weren't there on Markstrom before the trade deadline that have now entered the picture. The Flames are getting calls from multiple teams on Markstrom, not just from the Devils. So follow that away, Jay. Hmm. Um, but the bottom line is, as far as I could tell, at this point in time, there's still a difference of opinion on the return, on, on what it should cost the Devils to get Jacob Markstrom out of Calgary. Um, and the Flames, I think, are willing to be patient uh, in terms of having a team beat their price. Um, but you mentioned Allmark. That's another option uh, for the Devils. Uh, the Anaheim Ducks are listening on John Gibson. That's another uh, preeminent starter. Um, that's potentially available. So there's certainly options there for New Jersey. But 
as uh, Tom Fitzgerald, the GM, said to me yesterday, he also wants to add a bit of bite up front, hmm. a bit of sandpaper, and he wants to add another defenseman to his group. So he's got a lot on a lot on his list here for the Devils, who who clearly have a, the, the, the intention of bouncing back and making the playoffs next year. Yes, yeah, so they're maybe one of the most fascinating teams to watch this offseason. Maybe the most fascinating player to watch might be Jake Gensel, might be the, the best available unrestricted free agent. We know how terrific he was with Carolina when he got traded there, Pierre, and we know that Carolina would love to have him back. Uh, do you expect him to re-sign in Carolina, or do you expect him to look elsewhere? I think he's going to go to market, but I think he's going to go to market while telling the Hurricanes they're still in it. Okay. Um, that, that's a common thing with uh, players of his caliber where you don't want to close doors, but you want to open more. <laughs> and so what's happened is they did have negotiations last week. My understanding is the Hurricanes made an eight-year offer, um, but obviously they it wasn't accepted at this point. Um, read into that what you will. My, my guess is the AV wasn't high enough. But, you know, I think the, the, uh, the sales pitch in Carolina is the only team that can give him eight years. Right. Uh, if he goes to market, uh, the most he can get is seven years, as you know. So back and forth there, but all things being equal, uh, I'd be surprised if Jake Gensel doesn't go to market. This is his one shot at, you know, um, hitting the jackpot and giving himself more options. So... We'll have something to talk about. Yes. On July 1st on our air. This is what I, you know, I always think of you guys. I'm like, the more, the more guys going to market, the better. That just gives you some things to chat mm -hmm. about that day, which is a good thing. Hey, this is, I got it. Before I let you go, I got to ask you this. You surveyed a number of head coaches and team execs on who they thought would win the Stanley Cup this season. And you were actually pretty surprised by the results, weren't you? Yeah, I wasn't surprised that more people pick Florida than Edmonton. I anticipated that based on, you know, based on what the odds makers are telling us. But I was stunned by how lopsided it was. So I heard back from 17 NHL head coaches and 16 team executives. So 33 in total. 29 to 4 for Florida hmm. were the picks. Um, I thought it'd be more of a 60-40 split. And, and listen, these are all really smart people. So, you know, if you read my piece, they all have their reasoning for why they pick Florida and, and they break it down in their answer. And, and it all makes sense when you read it. But I will say that a lot of the reasons why they're picking Florida is a lot of the reasoning that I heard from people picking Dallas over Edmonton. Yeah. Um, so including the goalie edge, uh, the stars being deeper. So And listen, these things are true. Uh, I'm not saying I'm picking Edmonton. I, you know, I'm not making a prediction, but my point is the Oilers just proved that they could beat a team that felt like a deeper uh, lineup. Uh, and at the end of the day, I will say some of the coaches and executives who picked Florida did kind of have a PS in their comments saying, I'm not exactly comfortable going against 97 uh, in my prediction. And, you know, he's, he's the intangible. As he showed in that opening goal in game six against Dallas. Yes. You don't coach against that. Exactly. <laughs> That's... So he's the great equalizer. I, I can't wait to be there. It's going to be awesome, and you will be there. The Cup final starts on Saturday. Uh, safe travels to Sunrise, Florida in the Bell Media corporate jet. That's what you deserve. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll chat with you soon. Thanks so much for this, Pierre. I've never heard of this jet. All right, see you, buddy. <laughs>